learning curve that started about 10 years earlier in a place called Cape Canaveral. At that time, the Cape was nothing but marsh salt grass, corrugated steel buildings, and antennas. And it was there we learned of leadership, trust, values, and teamwork. Mission Control is an incredible leadership laboratory where our young controllers learn excellence. Excellence as an individual, as a team member, and as a leader. And there they learn the difference between the I and the we part of the team. Because when their time comes, we need our controllers to step forward, assume a leadership role, make their contribution, then return to the ranks within a team. Our work develops chemistry because chemistry in any organization is a force amplifier. It amplifies the individual's talent as well as the team's talent. And chemistry in our line of work leads to communication that is virtually intuitive because we must know when the person next to us needs help or a few more seconds to come up with an answer. In emission control, there's no such thing as a first team because once we launch, every team must be capable of accomplishing the mission. And finally, when we must act alone, and we know that time will come to each of us, we are never alone because we know our team stands with us. In our line of work, failure is not an option. When we started in 1960, our world was vastly different. A nation would soon be torn by the beginning of the conflict in Vietnam. During that decade, we would see three political assassinations, and the civil rights movement was just emerging within the nation. The Cold War with the Soviet Union provided the stimulus for the space program and guided every aspect of America's foreign policy. Computers existed only in laboratories. There were no global communications. And during that decade, American students would arrive on the campuses. Down at the Cape, we were struggling. America's space program was struggling. And then in 1961, a young, brash, and articulate President John F. Kennedy issued a challenge. He said, we choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. And when he issued this challenge, we were struggling to put a spacecraft in orbit. One month prior to the speech, we had blown up our second Atlas rockets. Nine days prior to the speech, we had launched Alan Shepard, so we had a total of 20 minutes manned spaceflight experience. We'd never been to orbit. We were challenged to go to the moon. So engineers and people experienced the flight test and a small group of 31 Canadians and Englishmen joined with the Mercury 7 astronauts and finally filled in Virginia to form a space task group that would win supremacy in space. Our boss was Walt Williams. Walt was the toughest man I have ever known. He was a brawler. More fitted to working as a longshoreman in New York or New Orleans or San Diego than leading the American space program. But in the business of aircraft flight test, Williams was a legend. He is the pioneer director of the NACA high-speed test station that today we call Edwards Air Force Base. It is a project manager for the X-1 rocket ship that in 1947 took Chuck Yeager and the world into the age of supersonic flight. Williams' deputy was prophetically named Christopher Columbus Kraft. Chris was the pioneer of manned spaceflight. He wrote the book on how we operate directed the implementation of the worldwide tracking network. He launched each one of the Mercury missions. But most importantly, he was the mentor, the teacher, and the tutor for the first generation of young people that became known as mission controllers. Mercury Control did not have a single computer. There were three mainframe computers supporting all of Project Mercury. Two of these mainframes, the first solid state machines ever produced by IBM, we're located 700 miles north of the Cape because IBM did not trust us to operate these new machines. <laughs> On the island of Bermuda, we put a reliable vacuum tube computer with a small team of seven controllers. We always launched eastward over the island such that we lost communication with our team in power flight, with our crew during power flight. Uh, Bermuda would tell the astronauts what to do when the engine shut down. Global communications consisted of a 60 word per minute teletype network that dated back to the days of America's Pony Express. So after a couple weeks training in spacecraft systems and operations, and after we all became very proficient in Morse code, because Morse code was our backup form of communication within the ground tracking network, as well as between the team of the ground and the crew in space. 
Once we achieved this proficiency, we sent young men to 13 tracking stations around the world. They went into the heart of Africa, they went to Zanzibar, and Australia, and ships at sea, islands in the Pacific. These were sites that were literally at the ends of the earth. And the risk to these young people was very high because the 60s was the end of the European colonial period. Most of these countries were in a state of civil war or revolution. My controllers at the Nigerian tracking station were twice rescued by the army. At Zanzibar, we'd work under the protection of the Gordon Highlanders and the Queen's Royal Rifles who would surround the tracking station during contact periods, and then bring their controllers back to the quarters of the Zanzibar Hotel Station, two gunners at the top of the stairs. These young people at the sites were eyes, their ears, and voice as the spacecraft passed over dead for their age they were given incredible responsibilities. They grew to be the leaders of Project Apollo. When I first ventured into space with Project Mercury, and each one of our chapters was, each one of our launches was a chapter in the history book of spaceflight. Our mistakes were violent, they were brutal, they were visible. Two of our first three Atlas rockets exploded shortly after they left the launch pad. Then we lost our first redstone. We sent the firing command, the engine ignited, lifted the forges off the launch pad, then the engine shut down. And through some miracle, the rocket landed back right in the launch stand without exploding. Escape tower fired, went up to about 4,000 feet, and then came plummeting down at the viewing stand. The senators and congressmen ran for cover. Our rocket engineers were speaking in German. We didn't understand what they were saying. We literally did not know what to do. But we were fortunate in those days because our nation understood there is no achievement without risk. There certainly weren't any guarantees in this new business that we call spaceflight. We put six Americans in space in our first two years and were close calls on every one of those missions, especially in John Glenn's and Scotty Carpenter's, when we got every one of our crewmen home. By the time that we had finished with Project Mercury, we had learned that man could live and could perform in space. But we learned much more. We learned of leaders through leadership. Leaders have integrity. They're teachers, they're team builders, they're great listeners, and when there's trouble, leaders are out front. We also learned a lot about ourselves as individuals because many of us came in from aircraft flight tests and our egos were much bigger than this room. There was tough at times to get people to work together. But we knew that success would only come as a team, so we became one. And we learned to check our ego at the door every day when we came to work. So we moved into the Gemini program. The Gemini was designed to develop and test and prove the technologies that we needed in order to go to the moon. One of these technologies related to the tools and the techniques we used in designing our mission trajectories. During Project Mercury, trajectory design was done by a large group of women, about a hundred of them. They were all mathematicians, and we called these women computers. Computers were people most of the early days, not machines. And these women would travel with us from a headquarters at Langley Field in Virginia, down to the Cape for each one of the launches. They'd bring the calculators along, they'd get down at the Cape, they'd punch away at the numbers, and write the answers down, they'd plot and graph paper. And these women would do this endlessly, day after day, just to design a single mercury trajectory. Well, this approach wasn't going to get to the moon, it wouldn't even get two spacecrafts around the moon in Gemini. So we finally did get computers, and each one of these machines was as big as a house. Five of them filled the entire first floor in a new mission control center in Houston. It even put a small 4,000 word computer on board the Gemini spacecraft. But the problem was, we had no computer experience. So we went to the colleges and universities throughout our nation and brought in the young people who were working with computers and laboratories. We went to the Army Missile Command at Fort Bliss in Texas because the Army had been working with computers in the Ground Air Missile Program. We took the new recruits that we got from the Army and merged them with the Mercury veterans, and we started working in the very edge of all knowledge, all technology, all experience. When we first started off in space, the Soviet Union had about a two and a half year lead on us. But when Ed White stuck on the spacecraft in the Gemini 4 mission, we had now narrowed that lead down to mere months. And then, on the next two missions, for the first time, we set America and spaceflight records. First for mission duration, and then when we accomplished our rendezvous. And when we had accomplished this rendezvous, we had developed the technologies we needed to reach further into space and go to the moon. But we continued to learn of ourselves and of our mission. We learned of discipline, of 
focus so intense upon the objective that we would never do anything personally that would compromise achieving that objective. We also found the value of high morale because we now knew we were succeeding because of our belief in our mission, our team, and in ourselves. So we moved into Apollo. We were in the consoles Friday afternoon, January 27, 1967. One month from launch, testing the Apollo Command and Service module. Crew members were Gus Grissom and White Roger Chapman. We had worked with Gus and, the Mer Gus and Ed in the Mercury and the Gemini program. And Roger was a Navy rookie preparing for his first space flight. But he's already pretty well known within our ranks because he is one of the pilots who took pictures over Cuba during the missile crisis. Just that Friday hadn't been going very well. We had problems with communication, we had problems with life support. Crew reported noxious odor inside the spacecraft. And the test procedures just weren't hanging together. And frequently throughout that afternoon, we'd shut down the countdown, work out the procedures, and then continue on. And at 6.27 that evening, we again shut the countdown down to start out the problems before we transferred from external power in the launch pad to internal power in the spacecraft. Four minutes after entering that countdown hole, we were startled by screams coming from our crew. And we listened to our crew's screams as they died. And with our death comes anger. Anger at ourselves because we knew we were responsible for America's first space disaster. We wrote two more words into our vocabulary that day. Tough and confident. Tough meaning we will never get shirked from our responsibilities because we are forever accountable for what we do, or in the case of Apollo Warner and our crew, what we fail to do. Confident, we'll never get take anything for granted. We will never stop learning. From now on, the teams and mission control will be perfect. We designed the badge, the emblem of the mission control team, the price for admission to our ranks, and where this will help them. Discipline, morale, toughness, confidence, commitment, teamwork. Because as a team, we must never fail. Now in our line of work, the boss is the flight director. He has a very simple job description. It is only one sentence long. It says, the flight director may take any actions necessary for crew safety and mission success. During the course of a mission, there is no higher authority. And the flight director is supported by a team of between 15 and 21 controllers. People specialize in trajectories and spacecraft systems. We have facility operators, we have planners. We have procedures writers. We have a medical doctor who looks after the ground team as well as the crew in space. And we have an astronaut who provides communications during the course of the mission. The mission controller are the young. They're generally in their early to the mid 20s. Flight directors are in their early to the mid 30s. And this team on the screen right now, whose average age is 26, is the team that in July 20, 1969, took Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and the world to the surface of the moon, and we literally fought every step of the way to get to the surface. When we shut the engine down on the moon, the moon that day, we had less than 17 seconds of fuel remaining, and we were in the process of coming down to a very difficult and very risky land port decision. When we shut that engine down and the crew walked on the surface, and they lifted off and we got those guys back home, we had fulfilled the pledge that we had made to our now dead president, John F. Kennedy, and the crew of Apollo 1. We launched again in November, Apollo 12, and as we left the launch pad, we had twice by lightning. We had three crewmen inside a dead spacecraft, thudding up towards space. The only thing working was booster propulsion, booster guidance. Mission Control had two minutes to save that mission. We voiced the instructions up to the crew to throw a very obscure switch that would restore a portion of our telemetry system. With the telemetry online, the team could get to work. We verified reactants were flowing in the fuel cells, put the fuel cells back online in the power system. We secured the navigation system, everything kept working, got the crew up in orbit, checked the spacecraft out, and a very gutsy move that day, we decided we'd take the Apollo 12 to the moon. By the time we got to Apollo 13, this was our third lunar landing mission. The two prior missions had been pretty sporty. We were hoping for a change. This mission would be going a lot smoother for us. Crew members were Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, and Ken Mattingly. Lovell and Hayes were the crew on the lunar module. They were scheduled to descend a very rugged landing site on the moon that we call Fraumara. 
Ken Mattingly was the command module pack. He remains, he remains circling the moon uh, in, uh, in lunar orbit. Now, missions run on trust. When you turn 7.5 million pounds of thrust loose at the Saturn V launch, that is commitment. There's no change in your mind and no turning back from that decision. And trust allows you to make the split second decision very rapidly, seek out every option that may exist. We lost an engine during the second stage of power flight. Very quickly, we looked at the remaining four engines, they were all gone. We computed the new engine shutdown, new engine shutdown times, verified we had enough propeller to get the group in orbit. Passed this information up, everything kept working, got them up in orbit, checked the spacecraft out, and two and a half hours later, we give the crew the go for transmitter injection. So now by the end of the second day, this crew is 200,000 miles from Earth. 50,000 miles from the surface of the moon. And we're entering a phase of the mission we use the term, entering the lunar sphere, Earth's gravity to the moon's gravity. And for a short period of time of four hours, you have two mission abort options if you decide you want to get home. One comes around the front side of the moon, takes a day and a half to return to Earth. The other one goes completely around the moon, takes between four and five days to get home. But you gotta make up your mind quick if you want to change your course because this time is running out. My team was in the console. We were just finishing our second shift. Everything was looking pretty good. During the shift, we had had a television broadcast from the crew. And during the broadcast, the crew's wives and families had been sitting behind me in the viewing room. Uh, when we secured the television link, the families went home. And now in my main control room, the noise level was building up because the next team of controllers had reported in for shift handling. And our flight director, who is Glenn Lunny, is the leader of the black team. We use colors to identify teams in those days. He is sitting next to me at the console, reading my log, preparing for handling. The final thing my team had to do was to put the crew to sleep. We have a five-page pre-sleep checklist we go through very carefully to make sure everything's properly configured before we give the go to start the sleep group. We got down to the final entry. And this final entry asks a question. Do we require a cryo stir? Well, the fuels on board the uh, spacecraft are cryogenic oxygen and hydrogen, a super dense, super cold liquid packed in vacuum insulated tanks at incredibly low temperatures of minus 300 and minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit. These cryogenics react with a catalyst in the fuel cell to produce electricity, and as a byproduct, they produce heat and pure water. So this is the energy, heat, and water resource we need to go to the moon, operate the vicinity of the moon, and return to Earth. Two days into the mission, however, I have used some of the cryogenics. If I could look inside the tank right now, I would see a two-phase condition, part liquid, part gas. And this results in unequal areas of pressure within that spherical vessel. So the designers put fans inside the tanks. We could turn on to stir this mixture up, make it uniform. And we had a heater that we used to raise the pressure. And this allowed us to control the inlet pressures to the fuel cells and to the life support system. One of my controllers came to me and said, Flight, let's give it, let's give the cryos a stir. So I voiced up to Jack Swagger, the spacecraft, that we wanted to stir the cryos, and he threw two switches. Now thing happened for 16 seconds. And then inside an oxygen tank too, a spark jumps between the fan and the heater or something. And the pressure in that tank rises very rapidly over the next six seconds until it blows the dome of the tank off. When the dome came off the tank, the insulation surrounding the tank caught fire. And it was like a blowtorch racing through the bay of the spacecraft, carrying out the instrumentation and the plumbing and the electrical systems. The shocking valves closed until the pressure increased to the point where it blew the side of the spacecraft off. When the side came off the spacecraft, the area surrounding, was surrounding it was enveloped in a cloud of debris from an explosion, frozen particles of oxygen. Now, we did not know an explosion had occurred. It's 55 hours, 55 minutes, and four seconds from launch. My voice was come alive. Hey, flight, we've had a computer restart. Another controller calls main blows up. Third one says antenna switch. And then from the spacecraft, I hear, we have a problem here. Ladies and gentlemen, Captain Jim Lowell, Commander of the Thank you for the introduction. And I know many 
ladies and gentlemen, you were really expecting Tom Hanks to be here. <laughs> now, now let me continue the saga of the flight of Apollo 13. You have just heard from Gene of the development of NASA's mission control team, a group of dedicated individuals formed by a gang of Apollo recruits into a very smooth operation, a very efficient organization, and they became very competent that they could handle any space challenge all the way up to the time they heard Houston, we have a power. Now I'm going to take you out of the control center, into the space room, to tell the other side of the story. It is a story of two groups. One group in a comfortable control room fortified by hot coffee and cigarettes that had to make quick and correct decisions. Failure is not an option, was her battle. To the other group, in a cold, damp, crippled spacecraft, some 200,000 miles from home, who had to correctly execute those decisions, success was the only option on their mind. Now, Gene mentioned Kennedy's speech. To land a man on the moon, bring him back safely for the other decade. That was a very daring talk in 1961. But if you go back and analyze his talk, reread his speech, you'll find that this was not a project of scientific exploration. To find out the consistency of the moon, the origin of the space of the solar system the origin of the moon itself. No, this was a technical challenge, a challenge to the people of the United States and to the world that we had the ability to put someone on the surface of the moon and get them home safely before 1970. We all know the story of Apollo. Thousands of people, hundreds of companies working hard to honor President Kennedy's today. I was on the very first flight to the moon. Apollo 8 didn't have a little module to land. Our job, and I was a navigator, to verify the navigation 240,000 miles out to the moon. Once we got there, to orbit the moon, to look for suitable landing spots, flat areas, that would give the people who would make the first landing uh, the greatest chance to survive. Gene mentioned, of course, Paul Levin made the first landing, very successful, and did it uh, before 1970. And we came back, everybody was happy. Well, almost everybody was happy. Believe it or not, there were still people in this country and in the world that didn't believe we did it. We thought we figured out West Texas someplace. So we quickly got a Paul 12 landing, fired in November of 1969. It landed into another flat area, and it was so successful that it landed within walking distance of a surveyor spacecraft that we landed about two years previous to that. Well, by the time the Model 13 came around, the scientific community came out of the room. They said, look, we've honored President Kennedy's today. We've landed people out of the room. <coughs> And we beat the mushrooms. But what we want is more science from the Apollo program. We want some spacecraft to land in the hills or the, the, the highlands of the moon. Because the reflectivity is much brighter there. The material might be different. Uh, we know there's a ejector line on the surface, thrown up by the volcanism and the early formation of the moon and by large meteorites in the and that can tell us a lot about the interior of the moon. Consequently, Apollo 13 was designated to a little place called Fall Bottom. Large crater, center of the moon, where the land with the hills of the highlands strong and there. Two weeks before the launch, we did a final test on the spacecraft called the Countdown Demonstration Test. The test was very successful. And when the ground crew came back to, to secure the spacecraft, one of the things they had to do 
was to remove the women logical from the two tanks on the spaceship. Unbeknownst to them, on one of the tanks, there was a serious error. They had severely damaged the heater system of that oxygen tank. But no one caught it. Everything was perfectly normal. And then just two weeks later, as we filled up that tank with liquid oxygen, it was a bomb with the off. Take off on 13, April 11th, 1970, at 1313 Central Standard. Well, right there I should have known something was going to happen. <laughs> the big Saturn V, of course, took all three stage vehicle. First stage, of course, worked perfectly. And as Gina mentioned, on the second stage, as it was pushing us faster and faster, first of all, to get into Earth orbit and check our spacecraft, the engine quit. And of course, in the spacecraft, uh, we thought, oh my gosh, no crisis, because most space flights have to crisis of some sort. Uh, we're very glad that the control, control center called up and said, don't worry, four engines are enough, enough fuel to get you into Earth. And so we did, with the help of the third stage, got into the Earth orbit. As we came around, we checked our spacecraft to make sure they were okay before we would uh, go to the moon. But when we got around the far side of the Earth, away from the moon, we looked at the third stage a second time. It gave us enough velocity and on a proper course to coast all the way to the moon. That course is called a free return course. It's called free return because if something should happen to the engine of our spacecraft, our maneuvering engine, if for instance uh, we, it wouldn't fire in space, I've never fired it before. Uh, so we run a course that would take us all the way to the moon without the use of that engine. And as we pass the moon, its gravity was going to slow us down, turn us around, and just with our little attitude engines, so we can hopefully make a, a safe passage on the way back, a free return passage to make a safe landing back on Earth. And that's why it's called free return. Every flight from Apollo 8 to 17 started out on a symmetrical safety factor. About 30 hours have gone by and everything in this spacecraft is working perfectly. I got a call from, from Mission Control. They said, look at uh, Jim, if you want to land in this place called Flop Mom, if you want to see the shadows of the rocks and the boulders on the surface and therefore in your lunar module you can maneuver to miss them, we'll have to get you off the ferry during course. Because what we want to have is the sun in the proper position so that you can see those shadows. Well, our two snake men, by the way, are buried together now. Uh, Aquarius, the lunar uh, landing vehicle, powered down, created nose to nose with our Odyssey, our command service module, which we do all of our work. So we looked at uh, the spacecraft again to make sure that everything was fine and it said it would be okay. So they gave us the attitude to maneuver to them. And we lit that maneuvering engine. It worked perfectly, moved us over to a new course called a hybrid course to the moon. This course, just like the previous one, would get us directly to the moon. But if something failed now, if the engine didn't work, something else happened. The Earth moon would still slow us down, turn us around, our attitude and engines would support, but the course went back to the Earth was about 40,000 miles down, much further out, and to make a safe landing on Earth. Didn't worry about it. My fourth flight into space. My second time to the moon. The stars, sights, sounds, even the smells were so familiar to me that I settled back for a very tranquil, a very quiet three day flight to the moon. Two days in one month. We're getting very comfortable. We're going to have a way to go on the surface. Suddenly, I got a call from Mission Control. They said, Jim, you haven't been reading the flight manual. I couldn't even grab the flight manual to find out what I had been reading. They said, now's the time to have a TV program to show all the people back on Earth what you're doing. I couldn't grab a TV camera. 
Fred Hayes, I learned about it. I had to swim through the open tunnel with the power down the open lodge. I fired him. Fred, power. Oh. Just photographing uh, Fred as he was telling everybody what we had there. He had rigged the hammock that he was going to sleep on on the river surface. Tried to demonstrate it by lying down, and of course, the zero gravity he bounced straight back up again. I turned around to show some of the, the packs that we were going to have on the river surface. But you got to remember, this was the third lunar landing flight. The signal came down from the spacecraft into the control center. Fed out to all three networks at that time. Didn't have a Fox or a CNN in those days. Nobody, nobody cared. On one uh, channel, or one network, I should say, uh, uh, Dick Cabot had a real live program and he had an interview. And I can see why he wouldn't care. This thing being the third flight to the moon. But on the second network, there was a rerun of a little sitcom called I Know Lucy. They didn't hear it. And then on the third network, at least in the city of Houston, Texas, the ball game was going on. Nobody was watching, uh, or everybody, I should say, was watching the ball game, including the control center. <laughs> I did get a rather cryptic communique from a capsule, of the cap club, who said, uh, Jim, we have a lot of work to do uh, down here. Can you cut the program a little short? I did. Say goodnight to everybody. Turned off the camera. I was coming down through that tunnel when suddenly there was a hiss bang. Spacecraft rocked back and forth, red lights to flash on, and just started to, f to see if he knew what was causing all this commotion. And I could tell from his expression, he had absolutely no idea. Then I quickly went to my third companion, <coughs> and my name was Jack Spiker. Jack's eyes were as wide as saucers. <coughs> Not only did he not know what was going on, but he was saying to himself, why am I here? <laughs> because you see, Jack Spiker wasn't supposed to be there. And Ken Nat, the, 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 the planet for that spot is Ken Natalie, as, as Gene had mentioned. But four days, four days before our flight, we discovered that the entire, entire crew had been exposed to the measles. As a matter of fact, Charlie Duke, our backup lunar module pilot, had the measles. Well, the doctors quickly looked at the medical records and found out, first of all, that Hayes and I were married. Our kids had the measles. We had the measles. We were not being to the disease. And it was a match. Never got married, never had kids that had the basic reports, and he never had the business. No doubt in the doctor's body that he was going to come down to just about the time he was by himself, orbiting the moon, waiting for Hayes and I to come up and bond him with him. Now, Gene had mentioned that you know, one of the great attributes that we needed is teaming. We had worked closely as a team for months sure that this Apollo 13 flight would be successful. I knew just from the inflection of his voice, hearing him on the radio, what he was going to do for any kind of missing that would occur. So I went up to the doctors. I said, look, I can't think of a better place to have a measles than a nice, cozy spacecraft orbiting in the moon. You can imagine how far I got without I got. Kim was dropped, his white nose put on door, and now things in the spacecraft began to happen. A light came on. Something is wrong with the electrical system. Before I could digest that piece of information, two more lights went on. Two out of three of your fuel cells have just died. I think Jake mentioned that a fuel cell is a device where you take liquid oxygen, the vitamin liquid hydrogen. Get electrical power and water, a major source of electricity. Our mission rules that if you lose just one fuel cell, the landing on the moon is off. A one fuel cell alone will comfortably give you enough power to go around the moon and get home to Earth safely. So at this juncture, there was a wave of disappointment in the spacecraft. The 
this is my, my second time up here. The only reason I'm here is to land on the moon, and now I can't land. And I drifted, drifted to the side of the spacecraft, and I glanced up at the instrument panel, and my eyes happened to focus on the instruments. They told me the conditions of two huge liquid oxygen tanks stored away in the back end of the spacecraft. All the service box. When I glanced at the quantity gauge of one of those tanks, the needle read zero. And when I quickly glanced at the quantity gauge of the second tank, I could see the needle start to come down ever so slightly, but something that you would never see on the normal user of the box on a flight to the moon. And that's what that old man waited and down on the you know that, that strange sensation you get when you're deep in trouble and don't quite know how to get out of it? Then I drifted over, past my group, looked out the side window. I can't tell you today why I did it, but I looked out the side window and I saw escape at a high rate of speed from the rear of my spacecraft a gaseous substance. And it didn't take much intelligence on my part to realize quantity gauge of my second tank, and the needle going down, and the gas escaping from the rear of the spacecraft were one and the same thing. And very shortly, we'd be completely out of oxygen. And that occurred because we used oxygen to produce electricity. The third fuel cell would die, we'd lose all of our electrical power. And that occurred because we used electrical power to control and enable our rocket engine we lose the propulsion system. We were in serious, serious trouble. We did have on board a small battery, small oxygen tank, merely to be used for the final plunge to the Earth's atmosphere when we would normally jettison our large consumers before we hit that atmosphere. By the time this explosion occurred, we were some 200,000 miles from Earth. We were 90 hours from Earth because we had to go around the boat to get back home again and we're going in the wrong direction to get home. Believe it or not, Mission Control couldn't quite believe what was happening. I mean, they thought that they, they saw on their instrumentation all these strange readings because they get what we had on our, on our instrument panel through telemetry coming down what we see on these right now. And when they saw these strange things like no oxygen, things like that, they thought, well, oh, it's got to be a sort of threat. Because we believe in redundancy. We believe in high reliability. How can we lose, you know, three fuel cells, two oxygen tanks, a computer world off the line, lost communications for a while, you know, all at one time? You know, this is not possible. So obviously, the communication coming down was interrupted by a sort of flare or something. And in the spacecraft, we knew what was going on. And by the time the mission control finally came to the conclusion and the realization that yes, there is something basically wrong here, Hayes and I had met in that tunnel and we were climbing our way into that lunar module to see if we could use it somehow, some way, as a lifeboat to get home. I have to tell you a little bit about the lunar module. We're a fragile device, not designed to come back home, no heat shield. If you so desire, the skin is so thin, you can take your fist and punch a hole through it. Designed to only last 45 hours. You only power it up once you're in the middle of it. Two people get in, attach, descend, land, explore, take off, rendezvous, knock, and then we flew the vehicle away. Designed to only support two people. And I count the crew. One, two, three, I knew that we were in deep trouble. But we got in the lunar module, turned on all the exotic equipment anyway, the guidance system, the, the computer. It used batteries, by the way, it didn't use fuel cells. And by this time, Mission Control Woody started to wake up. Gene got ready, all these people together, got good leadership going, all in, all sorts of uh, people, contracted people, other, other massive people that give some ideas. 
And they called him and said, we're not quite sure what happened. We don't know if we could salvage this flight, and I knew we could with the loss of the flight. He said, but uh, uh, we better get you on that journey to enforce it. I thought that was a pretty good idea. I thought it would be much better for me to be on a course that would take me out to the road and come around and come back again and intercept the earth in some manner, not so much that it was survivable, rather than to be a permanent monument to the space program that was a long and open orbit around the earth at 40,000 miles and out at 240,000 miles and back again at 40,000, you know, for years and years and years. I said, that's fine. He said, Okay, we're thinking of an attitude for you to move these two vehicles soon. And as soon as we get that attitude, we'll send it up to you and then we'll try to get you back on after we return. I said, fine. And also they said, is everything dead in the command module? They said, yes, we have to use our lunar module engine to do this. Uh, the command module is, you know, there's nothing there, we can't use it at all. They said, okay, we'll do some landing engine for the other lunar module. They gave us the attitude and I started to maneuver do this block attitude so I can light the edge of it. And what I did, I learned something that I took with me from the public sector of space into the private sector of business. Always expect the unexpected. When everything is going up, your profits are up, the rise, product is selling, things are fine. Kind of look down the tracks of lights. There's something that's coming up, some symptom that might in the future express or start a crisis. Because when I started to maneuver, and remember that I had spent hundreds of hours learning how to maneuver a little module in simulators. But when I started to maneuver and I say I wanted to pitch down, it went to some wild generation. Why did I do that? And if I wanted to go right, it went left. If I wanted to go up, it went down. What's wrong out here? Why? What's happening? Why can't I fly this in the body? Gone on me. We had a 60,000 pound dead mass in that service module attached to the lunar module. The command module, of course, was the only thing that had a heat shield to get us back to the Earth's atmosphere. The lunar module had never been designed to have this dead mass attached to it, the tip of the the center of gravity was way out in left field someplace. In a short period of time, I had to learn how to deliver all over the world. I had to know that when I put an input in, I would know what the outcome was. But you'd be surprised if you're in deep trouble how quickly you learn. I finally got to the proper attitude, lit the landing engine, moved us over to help me get the log there on the free return course. Breathe a little sigh of relief, and then we waited. And when I looked out the lunar module window, the moon was getting very, very big. We're only about 25,000 miles away, but past the sphere of influence, where the moon's gravity now is greater than the Earth's, and its accelerating was towards the moon. I kept waiting for the ground to call up, uh, saying, Do you have any ideas and everything? And funny, I did get a message from Mission Control. And they said, Jim, we called in all these people. We're sitting around trying to figure out what's wrong and more than that. How do we get you home? And uh, we finally all came to the conclusion that uh, the way you are right now, doing nothing different, you won't get home. I said, I've come to that conclusion. Do you have a solution? <laughs> I need a solution. And they said, well, we have one. We've been thinking about it. Sitting around the school. We think that when they Moon slows you down, slowly turns you around at the end of your long orbit there, and you're heading back towards the Earth. As you pass the Earth, we'll have you light that decent engine, that lightning engine, the second time, and perhaps we can speed up your return home and get you back into the atmosphere before those batteries die. That's the most important thing. Well, I agree with you, we don't have a better plan here. And they said, now wait a second, uh, we just bought this up, we don't know whether it works or not, we're sending the crew down to the simulators. You know, to work the uh, procedures, and if they work fine, we'll send them the instructions. I said, fine, I'll be all set. They said, now, you're getting close to the moon, and as the moon starts to pull you around, you lose communication with us, so if you should bring the copy, if these procedures prove to be okay. 
I said, okay, I have my two companions here. You know, if I miss something, uh, I'm sure they'll pick it up, and uh, so make sure we get the procedures correct. And a little while later, as the boat kept getting bigger and bigger, and we kept going faster and faster, I got a call from Mission Control. They said, yep, yeah, these procedures seem to be okay. Are you ready to copy? And I said, I certainly am. I started to copy the procedures, and I, I looked at my companions. They weren't listening. They had cameras in their hands and they looked at the moon. One guy wasn't trying to figure out center speed. The other guy was looking at the aperture center. <laughs> I said, Jim, what are your plans here? And they said, Jim, when we go around on the far side of the moon, we're going to take some pictures. I said, if we don't get home, you won't get developed. <laughs> and they said, no, oh, not if we've been here before. So I got the procedures, two and a half hours after we passed the far side on the way back, we lit the engine the second time, and it pushed us faster and faster. It was off about four and a half minutes, faster and faster towards the earth. And just as we turned it off, a orange light came on. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide was rising in the lunar module from our exhalation. Carbon dioxide is poisonous high concentrations, even though we exhale all the time. We have lithium hydroxide canisters in the environmental system of the module to remove carbon dioxide. But there were only enough for two guys for two days, there were three guys for four days. And that carbon dioxide has continued to rise. Mission control also spun, which is very good and gives you an idea of their mission. They figured out what we had in the spacecraft and then went in and looked at the command module. It had square canisters. And there were plenty of them. But the lunar system used round canisters, and we couldn't take a square canister and put it in the lunar module system. So they figured out what we had, and it consisted of duct tape, piece of plastic, cardboard from a, 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 a mango and a whole sock. And with that, we could jury rig a square canister to work with the lunar module system to remove the carbon dioxide. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here because we would poison by our own exhalation. So that was another thing that we just decided on. And about that time, Gene had a call. Chuck Berry, the chief medical officer, came up to Gene and said, look at these guys that have been waiting for so long. So James said, well, well maybe it's it. But before that, John Aaron, the electrical engineer, came up and said, you know, they can get their sleep later if we don't turn down all the electrical equipment. Uh, you know, uh, they won't have enough electrical power to make a safe entry back on the earth anyway, so sleep doesn't really matter. By that time, Gene is juggling electrical or sleep, but then the uh, chief designer, Max J, came by and said, look at that. That's all good and well, but if you don't barbecue the spacecraft now, because it's been steady one side towards the sun for this length of time, if you don't start that barbecue, it will damage the spacecraft, so much of the power and safety don't make any difference. So Gene quickly ready it up, and we did the barbecue, started up, we turned off the electrical equipment, you know, the guidance system that told us our attitude with respect to celestial sphere meter for navigation. Shuttle off too much power. The computer, in its memory, we had the information of the stars, we didn't have to shut it down to. Uh, the autopilot, the control system, that helped me manage these two vehicles around, had to turn it off. Only thing we had going for us was a radio to talk to the Earth. That little fan is certainly the atmosphere. And then we were supposed to go to sleep. Things were quiet. Things are quiet, and you're trying to sleep, and you start to think. And it was Jack Swiker that came up to me and said, Jim, you know, I've been thinking. Hmm. We might be seeing a state velocity. We had that velocity. Um, let me explain that if I can. If I walk outside of this hotel, baseball in hand, no atmosphere above us, space only. 
If I could throw that baseball out of space, I would look over at 55,000 miles an hour. The baseball is not coming back to the Earth. It will not go on orbit about the Earth. It will eventually escape from the Earth and go into an orbit about the Sun. I said, Jack, I know all about that. It might be at a very high velocity, but we're on that free return course. That course should guarantee us safe passage back in the atmosphere and a safe landing back on Earth. How does it do? A lunar flight coming back to the Earth and pretend the normal section of the atmosphere is flat. We have to come inside a 2 degree pie shaped wedge. That wedge can be in the rest of 5 and a half degrees, any degree of 7 and a half degrees. We have to flood away into a 2 degree pie shaped wedge or a safe land. Come in too shallow and we skip up like skipping a storm on water. Coming too steep and the sun deceleration will make it a fire in the air for a few brief seconds. So I said, Jack, relax, no problem. Famous last words. Well, I was tracking this by this time. Thought I had got a call. And they said, they said, Jim, we don't know what you're doing up there. However, we've been tracking for some time. You're no longer that free to join course. We've extrapolated your course back. Earth, and you're going to miss the atmosphere by at least 60 to 80 kilometers. <clears throat> I said, thanks a lot. I said, we're flying by the city of Japan somewhere. We turned off all of our electrical equipment. We can't get it, get it back on to navigate. And they said, yes, we remember that. Uh, we are we're all about it. They said, do you remember your first flight to the Apollo? We made the first flight there. Everything was new. We weren't too sure what was happening. We had a lot of emergency procedures in the flight back up, but we had one last emergency procedure that was on the back page. In case everything else failed, we <coughs> to the back page and try this. I said, yes, I do. I haven't developed it since I was on the flight, but you know, after Apollo 8, we tore the bottle of flight manuals and we were in the same way. They said, you're going to have to use it now. But that new system, and this is the entire procedure, was to maybe somehow manhandling these two spacecraft around without the aircraft to help me get the Earth in the window of the little module. We've all seen pictures of the Earth in space. Daylight, darkness, that line between the two we call twilight here as it passes overhead. Out there we call it the target. I had a gun sight, crosshairs, in my window of the little module. If I could somehow get the Earth in the window of the little module and superimpose horizontal line of my crosshair on the Earth's terminator who would then place the engine to either steepen up or shallow up that angle of the way home. Depending on which side I had up and down and if I had let the engine at just the right time. That is the entire procedure. I looked at Jack and I said, Jack, even the clock is a one, but you have a response. You tell me I want to light the engine and tell me I want to stop. He said, fine. I looked over Fred Hayes. Fred was getting sick at the time. But I said, Fred, I know that when that engine comes on, when I don't want to power to help me, I'll have a hard time keeping the earth in the window. I'll take my maneuver handle. I'll keep it going, going up and down too much. You take the backup handle and you keep on going inside the too much. He said, fine. So I my console, I had two buttons. On the one long time they're ever used in the space program, the ball. One said start, the other said stop. <laughs> right up to the lane from the battery to the engine. All we have to goes from the battery to the computer that does all the work on the engine. Couldn't afford that. Bob time Jack said start, I had the start time, and the engine came on. And uh, that 14 so I jack it a horizontal vertically. Then, of course, I ran 14 seconds later, we hit the stop button, and then we waited for the uh, trackers to come back up. Fortunately, we got back into that corner, coming back in for a safe landing. And the last crisis for those three parachutes, the pyrotechnics took them up had been coastal for four days. And if they hadn't fired, fire, the shoes would not have come out. We'd been right on course, right where we should have been, except going so fast that we had a Disaster. But those shoes came out and made a very safe thing. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the story of a 
Apollo 13, but let me tell you the war. You can come on. Why am I here? Shouldn't be here. Lost of all the oxygen. No electrical no power. Can't use the pulse system. 200,000 miles out of space. I'm here because of a dedicated group of people in mission controls. People who had those three good leadership, teamwork, and initiative, perseverance. These are the people that make any mission, whether it's space or commercial or business, a success. And that's the reason why we're here today to tell you this is I'll leave you with a little saying that I heard. Uh, many of you have heard it probably. I think it's kind of bad for now. There are three types of people in this world. People who make things happen. People who watch things happen. And then people who just want to happen. <laughs> Back in 1970, the control mission, there were people that made things happen. Thank you.